Welcome to Arpens Profiles in Excellence. Today's guest is Dr. Jennifer Clifford, a professor at the University of Massachusetts, who will speak about environmental economics within the business world. I'm excited to have with us today my mentor and former professor, Dr. Jennifer Clifford, who teaches environmental economics at the Harvard Extension School. Today, Mrs. Clifford will share with us real live examples of companies and the impact economics and sustainability has on their bottom lines. Join me in this segment as we speak with Dr. Professor Jennifer Clifford. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for this segment. Uh, today, we're honored to have with us uh, Professor Jennifer Clifford uh, to speak on environmental economics as well as some very interesting case studies on sustainability that companies are developing. Uh, Jennifer is a professor professor from the University of Massachusetts, as well as lecturer at the Harvard Extension School for Sustainability and Environmental Management. And Jennifer, it's so great to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Michael. It's wonderful to see you again. Absolutely. After so, years, so, yeah. after so many years, yes, you you were my professor nearly ten years ago, and uh, time definitely flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Professor, one of the questions that I'd like to jump into uh, is understanding, especially from a cost perspective, and uh, we talked previously in regards to um, how companies uh, support uh, sustainable programs through their products and adding additional green costs and those type of things. So in your experience, um, can you share a little bit about how uh, companies face the issue in terms of costs in developing their products to support communities that they work in? Well, um, really investing in sustainability, um, your workers and the environment pays off in the long run. Um, And we can put this under the, the general umbrella of corporate social responsibility, which encompasses the environment and Basically, the triple bottom line, people, profits, and planet all do well. Um, So businesses that it's been shown empirically that businesses that do well for society by protecting the environment, the communities, and the planet do well in the long run. Um, And this is, of course, referred to as the triple bottom line or triple win that we talked about, Um, profits, people, and planet or the three Ps. Um, And what it's uh, said in corporate social responsibility is that businesses exist to serve a purpose. They they exist to make products that improve customers' lives, to provide employees with a healthy and enriching workplace, and to preserve the environment for future generations. Um, So, The idea is to serve a purpose and the profits will follow. Well, where is the proof or or the evidence? Um, I I, I could cite one study done by the British economist, Alex Edmonds. Um, He did, uh, he conducted a huge econometric study of the correlation or causation between um, profits and employee well-being. And what he did is he used 26 years of data from uh, which was easily accessible because um, Fortune magazine, yeah, I'm sure you're uh, both familiar with, is um, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Every year they name the 100 best companies to work for in America, and so he took the data from Fortune magazine, which um, considers both quantitative measures such as pay and benefits and qualitative measures such as trust in management, um, camaraderie with colleagues, um, and just pride in in job, in their job. Um, so Fortune considers all of these things when they name the 100 best companies to work for. So in his economic in his economic analysis, Edmonds isolated for the impact of employee well-being on future stock returns. 
So how he did this is, yeah, he controlled for all the other independent variables, such as company size and all the, you know, there's, there's um, dozens of variables that would go into this, um, the dependent being corp, um, profits. And what he found is that, in, and the, the reason he did this too, is he wanted to show or to see if employee well-being is what causes good performance or okay. yeah, rather than good performance allowing for companies to spend on employee well-being. Because we know that they're correlated, but he was looking for causation. and The order of causation, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so what he found is that the 100 best companies – delivered stock returns that beat their peers by two to 3% every year. Um, so the conclusion, I guess, is that treating workers well is costly, but it pays off. Um, some, it was thought at some time or by some companies to pay your little your workers as little as possible and work them as hard as you can but this does not pay off in the long run maybe in the short run but this is a, another reason to focus on the long run or the long term um, and <laughs> yeah do you want do you want me to tell you about any in investment funds or well, I, I think that's quite interesting because looking on the internal aspects of companies and how they, if they're making the investments, not only for the well-being of their employees, but the environments that they're working in, the, the return that they see in-house is being made exponentially in terms of their revenue growth. Uh, two to three percent is a significant amount if you're looking year over year. Um, I, I know you have an extensive amount of experience in Central America, <clears throat> Asia as well, and those type of programs where companies have put together sustainable models tied, linked very tightly to their actual revenue generating business model. Do you have any examples that you'd like to share of companies that successfully have done that? Well, yeah, one of, one of my favorite is um, Tox, T-O-K-S. It's a um, Mexican restaurant chain. It's the second most profitable restaurant chain in Mexico. And um, okay, well. my... Yeah, my colleagues at, um, I, I'm a principal at um, Turnstone Environmental Planning, and two of my colleagues and I, Jill Haley Murphy and Carlos Vargas, wrote a case study about um, coffee in Chiapas. And Carlos and I were, were students in your class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's professor. yeah, he got his PhD in sustainable finance. Switzerland. In Switzerland, mm -hmm. yep. And he's a professor at, at Harvard Extension and Harvard Summer School now, too. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. Sorry, you were talking about TOKS, a T-O-K-S, in, in mm -hmm. Mexico, in the food chain, and, and the programs that they've developed as part of their actual uh, revenue-generating business, but linking that with sustainability as well. Yes. Um, TOKS, yeah, it is... A, one of the most profitable restaurant chains in Mexico. Um, they have more than 200 restaurants, but their primary goal, they're in business to help Mexican people and Mexican society. That's, this is their overriding goal. Um, and one of their major goals is to prevent migration of people, Mexican people to the United States. Because when you think about it really, what mother wants their child to, especially be an illegal immigrant to another country? I mean, what could be more painful than that? Um, mm -hmm. So th this is horrible for Mexican society if people are left with no choice but to immigrate. So what Talks wants to do is provide economic opportunities in Mexico and they, they have done quite, they've had a lot of successful um, it, cases. The, the case study that we wrote is about coffee farming in Chiapas, Mexico, um, and how talks help 
basically they ordered their coffee from these coffee farmers who before talks came into the picture, they were earning $80 USD um, per household per year or per month, sorry, per month. Still, yeah, for a household. Um, and Still talks, yeah, um, talks help them to become more productive and uh, invested in, um, in giving them pre-orders and improving productivity. A, a lot of the coffee plants were dying from this coffee rust leaf disease, La Roya, Okay. Um, which was migrating north from South America because of climate change. And so they replaced a lot of the coffee plants, helped the farmers. And the um, now the, the monthly household income went up to 500 USD from 80 with tax help. Yeah. And they're so expanding this. Yeah, they're expanding this to other areas. But this is, um, it talks has, has a lot of um, socially responsible um, or, or helping businesses in Mexico. One case was, um, look, uh, their, their director of corporate social responsibility is Gustavo Perez Berlanga, and he basically finds projects to invest in and to help with the aid of talks like what he did with um this santa rosa company this is this is gustavo's book santa rosa okay um, a cup of inspiration um it's in guanajuato and what there was a there's a marmalade company there a marmalade factory mm -hmm. that was run by five run by five women and it's the Best. You you can't even imagine how good it is, and the smell. It <laughs> smells like heaven. It, all these strawberries, and it's like the cleanest place I've ever been in. Um, but so, Gustavo just dis Gustavo discovered these women at like a farmers market or something, and mm -hmm. he just he had talks help them scale up by pre-ordering and pre-paying for a huge um, uh, delivery of marmalade and they used it in all their restaurants and sold it. It's become extremely successful, basically supporting the whole town. Um, all these women have sent their kids to college. Um, and this is, this is an area where women didn't really have many opportunities. So, this, and now, now they're exporting the marmalade to Williams and Sonoma in oh, wow. you know that um, gourmet shop in in uh, absolutely um, yeah it's such a quality quality product um, and wherever talk so Tox has a lot of other um, programs that they integrate into their business their restaurant business but it helps Mexican society tremendously. Um, like they have, they buy mole, um, honey, chocolate, Christmas ornaments. And then they, they have the Christmas trees in their restaurants are in um, planters and then they plant them again instead of cutting them up down. And, and um, they have this program Reintegra in Mexico City, it helps at-risk youth by training them for different job skills. But it just runs through, this attitude runs through the company. Um, I was thinking some, their, their CEO, oh, I, I think I sent you the case study. Did I, Michael? I don't know if you had time yep. to. Yeah. Yes, you did. Yep, yep, I've got it with me, actually. <laughs> um, the C the CEO, <laughs> the owner, um, Carlo, Juan Carlos Alverde, um, mm -hmm. when there was, uh, um, the, when the earthquake happened in Mexico City, he was out personally, night after night, day after day, giving out water and helping people. You know, he, he could have just had other people do it, but he and his employees were 
or helping everyone. When there was a big flood in um, Villa, Villa Hermosa, um, what they did is they opened up the Tox restaurant and let everyone eat for free for two weeks, as long as it oh, lasted wow. the effects of the flood. Um, and of course, now they have a tremendously loyal following that patronize them all the time, you know. So they, they have a very good uh, reputation, that's for sure. So not only were they able to retain, but to develop talent in the local areas that they're working in, but also to build their brand reputation and, and loyalty. That, that's amazing. One of the questions I had on that is because we, we've looked at a lot of different companies <clears throat> that come up with programs that may be similar to these in various industries, everything from uh, F&B all the way over into logistical, including as well as pharmaceutical. But the question that I always have is, are these projects typically run or put together and inspired by specific individuals that have a passion themselves? Or do you think that there are processes, goals, or <clears throat> metrics that can be built into a company that helps to generate this inspiration in this, in this corporate culture of driving sustainability without having one specific individual behind the scenes and their personal devotion. Because if you think about it in that regard, if that one person moved to a different role, moved to a different company, what could they leave standing behind that would continue to drive that? Well, I, I, think, I think you're right that it's, it's both. Um, so a lot of times it comes from the, the ownership or the beginning of the company. Um, and I think um, Alex Edmonds gives an example of George Merck, who started Merck Pharmaceutical. And okay. they, they were the first to produce penicillin in 1942. And he said that pharmaceutical companies exist to help people. That's, that's the purpose of his company. Medicine and science is to help people. And he shared the, the formula or um, the way of making penicillin um, large scale with all the competitors, which went on to save thousands and thousands of lives in World War II because of his decision. I read about that. He refused to patent it. He refused to to, uh, to exclusively patent it and and let everybody else use it. I guess today we would call that open source, but th that's an amazing story. Uh, that's amazing. In our in our company, uh, we we're actually very fortunate is that the president of our company is passionately and very dedicated to developing sustainability. Uh, and just as small <clears throat> examples, we have with within our corporation, we have two subdivisions, two separate entities. Uh, one called Renewable Now. Uh, and another one called Arpen Strong that is exclusively looking at focusing on developing projects, renewable energy, um, sustainability, uh, investing in technologies. Um, in our headquarters, for example, in Rhode Island, um, our gym is linked to the grid. So actually, when wow. you're on the treadmill, when you're using the exercise machines, it feeds into the grid. And right now, um, our, our trucks as well. Uh, there was a project that was done a few years ago in, in with a, a, not so much a joint venture, but within <clears throat> cooperation with automotive companies to build solar panels on the roofs of the trucks that we use so that trucks no longer have to idle when they're parking or when they're unloading. And they could actually use wow. the solar uh -huh. to to reduce the emissions and those kind of things. And, and these are just some examples that are amazing. And, you know, from the Arpen Strong Endeavor, <clears throat> they work in Mexico as well. Um, a lot in Haiti and and development projects and rebuilding after uh, disaster relief and those kind of things. And we and internationally, because we have offices not just in Rhode Island, but we're in uh, London, we're in Frankfurt, Germany, we're in Dubai, uh, wow. obviously Shanghai, China, uh, Singapore as well. And what we see happening in the U.S. has been a huge inspiration for what we can do locally and, and how we can build those projects here. But it always raised the question for me is if we want to keep that alive, if we want to really um, develop that as a culture within our company, what can we set up that it doesn't have to be that, you know, our president who has a personal passion, a lifelong commitment to it, 
to keep it alive, to keep it moving, to keep it rolling forward. Do you think that goals and departments or structures are, are critical in that aspect? Or are there different ways that we can look at it? Well, I think that the, the passion of your CEO is one reason that the company is successful and this commitment and that your company is able to like look at you to have employees who are passionate about the company and dedicated to the company. This is how you you retain good employees with the good company environment, just like, um, you know, pride in the, in your work and pride in the company. So I think that this carries forward. Um, It's set, set, maybe set in the beginning by the president or founder, but, it's now basically attracts people who care about that to work for your company and retains good people because of the, the company's commitment. So it, it creates a collective group. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I, I definitely think that will so carry on. Many, yeah. many of our Carry on, absolutely. Yes. Many of our viewers today come from different industries. Um, they also come from different roles, from human resources to global mobility mm-hmm. talent, supply chains, finance, many, many different avenues. In terms of wanting to add a contribution in their role, what would you suggest just small things that people can think of every day to take care of the environment that they're working in and be a contributor? to the environment and to the sustainability of their company as they work day in, day out. So how can people take on things individually? Yeah, what are the small things that we can do every day? You know, a a lot of times when when we look at the big picture, sometimes it's almost too too big. It's too exasperating to see how, you know, how one person can engender change on a, a large scale or one person that can influence company policies to make the right changes, sometimes that is too far down the line. But what would you say is an important thing that people can think about that they can do every day on their own and actually begin to engender this spirit of sustainability within their roles? Well, that's that's a very good point. Um, But just all individuals, consumers and individuals, determine what is going to be produced and how it's produced. Demand always drives supply. If there's a demand for something, it's going to be supplied. Um, So we as consumers or individuals in the economy determine how our resources are used. And that's why buying something is important. Uh, The choice to buy something, it's like it's voting for it to be produced. So um, I think that Consume all individuals have a lot of power, maybe more more than we think we do, but we're sending a message to the market with all our purchases. And people are individuals are becoming more and more concerned about what companies are doing. Companies are reporting more, especially larger companies, on their corporate social responsibility. Um, and people like this and want to support these companies. How did I find out about these was, was the social media. Um, you know, we're following them and learning about them. And, and this way of communicating allows consumers like, like us um, to have more information and to make those choices. So next time when we're out and we're, we're shopping for cars, that's going to be in my mind. That's going to be, well, you know, we could go with this company or we could go with that brand. Um, I would prefer investing in a company that is investing back into the environment and cleaning up ocean plastics, running shoes with Adidas is is absolutely amazing. So it's interesting that you highlighted that because the transparency factor is is playing a big role these days. Well, Um, Professor Clifford, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, It was an absolute pleasure to connect and and discuss these topics, uh, especially with your expertise and background. It's incredibly monumental in, and coloring in the details and understanding how companies affect the environments, communities that they work in, and ultimately how it affects their own performance. 
So thank you so much for sharing and, and thank you for joining us and providing your time during this time, during this session. Thank you, Michael. It's wonderful to see you. Yeah, and keep, keep up great work. It's evident that the more exposure companies are getting through multimedia channels, through social media, or through general exposure in the public, the more the consumers are wanting to get information on how these businesses are conducting their business and how are the products that they are purchasing being produced. It's evident that through CSR, this is now becoming the measurement stick of which consumers are using to purchase or decide where to spend their money and with whom to spend their money. Thank you for watching the interview and we invite you to watch the next in the series. While you're here, please subscribe to the Arpin International Group channel. Thank you.